want to share with you some material on um, healing, but also deliverance. Now, obviously, this church fo- hosted the ISDM conference, so you don't have a lot of issues with deliverance in this house. But there are some churches that do, and even churches that are okay with deliverance may not always understand the linkages that can happen between healing and deliverance. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight. And I want to start with a story um, about a hernia in a baby boy who, when I met him, it was early 2017, so closing in on two years ago. And at the time that I uh, met this boy and his parents, he was two months old and I was in China. And I'd arrived the day before and I woke up in the morning and I had a message from the church that had invited me to come. And they, uh, they said, you know, we want you to pray for this baby. So I went over there and he was, you know how babies are at that age. And he was fussy because he had what's called an inguinal hernia. And unless you're a doctor, that's going to mean nothing. But it's a hernia that forms right here at the joint where the leg meets the, the body, uh, the abdominal part of the body. So right there. And as with hernias, the intestines were kind of poking through and he had kind of a bulge and he was fussy because it hurt. And he was young enough, they hadn't been able to really do anything in terms of surgery. And um, since he'd been born, he hadn't really slept much, if at all. And so he was cranky and fussy. And if you've ever had a child, you know just how pleasant that can be. So the parents brought him and they also brought Uh, the mother of the father. So the baby's grandmother was present, and it's now we're talking the paternal grandmother. And the nursemaid that was helping them care for this child, but the whole of four of them were worn out with the fussing and no sleep and so on. Now, of note, the father also had had an inguinal hernia when he was born, It had been surgically repaired when he was eight years old, but it was China of another era, and in the middle of the operation, the power had gone out. Oops, yeah. So they'd kind of done what they could to wrap it up by candlelight or something, but it was never a particularly good fix to the hernia. And so the father was, you know, I mean, he was getting along in life, but he had issues and had had ever since he was eight years old. In addition, the the baby's grandfather and great-grandfather had also had the same condition. And as far back as anyone knew, all the the firstborn males of the family had had this. Now, unless you flunked uh, Deliverance 101, you you immediately go, ah, generational curse. But what are you going to do with that? I mean, putting a label on it doesn't help you fix it. And so... Initially, what I did was I, I'm, I'm looking at this thing, and I'm thinking, I'm supposed to pray for this hernia. Awesome. Uh, God, could I get on a plane and go home to Los Angeles, please? And uh, the heavens were silent. <laughs> they were brass. So I'm like, okay, here we go. So I pray for the baby. You know, hernia, be healed. Didn't work. So what I normally do when things don't work is I get quiet, and I slow down a lot. So I ask the Lord about what I should do with this, and as I waited on the Lord, and and let me be clear, this was about a 20-minute waiting on the Lord. This wasn't pause, take a breath, and then go forward, because initially I wasn't getting much. Maybe I was just foggy from jet lag. I had only arrived in China the day before, but anyway, I'm waiting on the Lord, and I got a very distinct impression. I wouldn't say, just for those of you that are, you know, moving in these things, I would not say that it was a strong impression. I would just say it was distinct. And there's a difference there, right? So signal strength was like one or two bars on your phone. But, the, but it, was, it was distinct what was coming through. And the Lord said to me, where in my word did someone's intestines come out of their body? So my first thought was, well, Herod was, uh, had that happen when they said the voice of a man, or excuse me, the voice of a God and not of a man, and the angel of the Lord struck him. But as soon as I answered that, I went, I know that's not the right answer. And then I thought, Judas, he hung himself, and when he fell down, his intestines spilled out, but I knew that wasn't it. (coughs) So I waited a bit more, and I didn't get anything else that came to mind, and I'm I'm pretty astute with the scriptures. I'm what some people consider a Bible beaver, and so I, I just wasn't quite sure what to do with all this, 
And I picked up my phone and I did what every well-trained deliverance minister does these days. I Googled. <laughs> and I said, intestines come out of body, Bible, send. And even though I was in China, it worked. And, and I came up with the story of King Jehoram from the Old Testament. I'd, I'd read it many times, but I'd forgotten the story. Now, for those who don't know it, Jehoram was the son of King Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was a mostly righteous man, but he was a weak-willed man, and his probably single biggest problem in life was that although he was mostly righteous, he made alliances with King Ahab. Everybody here knows who Ahab is, right? Because he was married to? All right. Got the right crowd. So, in fact, what you might not know is that it was such a close alliance that Jehoshaphat gave his son Jehoram in marriage to the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. That's called a marriage alliance. Maybe they were trying to reunite the monarchy from when they'd split into Israel and Judah many years before, centuries before. But whatever the reason, he'd done this. Not the best thing he ever thought of. And it says of King Jehoram, well, it actually, it says that uh, Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. And he had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jehael, Zechariah, Azariah, Michael, and Shephatiah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel. So what we're being given is there's six princes and a crown prince, and the crown prince became the king. Their father gave them great gifts of silver, gold, and valuable possessions together with fortified cities in Judah, but he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. And when Jehoram had ascended the throne of his father and was established, he killed all his brothers with the sword and also some of the princes of Israel. Why some of the princes of Israel? Because they were his brothers-in-law. What's he trying to do? Consolidate power. Wipe out anybody who could make any claim to the throne. That's what's going on here. And so Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, as the house of Ahab had done, in brackets, into which he had married, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife. <clears throat> well, the story goes on, and it says that because of the various wickedness, as wickednesses, that's not really a word, but anyway, the, the various uh, transgressions that Jehoram engaged in, in verse 18 of 2 Chronicles 21, it says, after all this, the Lord struck him in his bowels with an incurable disease, and in the course of time, at the end of two years, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he died in great agony. I'm in 2 Chronicles 21. Oh, I hear a phone. Can I make a request? If you're expecting an important call or text, put it in, in vibrate mode. I'm, I don't know, I'm ADHD enough that when a phone goes off, I kind of, uh -huh. purple squirrel, purple squirrel. <laughs> If you're not expecting anything important, just shut it off. You won't miss anything important anyway. Okay. So <clears throat> I, I, I found this scripture, and as I was looking at it, the Spirit of the Lord says to me, well. <laughs> what do you mean, well? So I asked the father where they were from, and he and his wife were both what we call MBBs, Muslim background believers. They'd come from a small town in western China that was a 100% Muslim area. It had been converted to Islam more than a 1,000 years ago. And at the time they were growing up there, it was a town of about 300, but now it was a town of about 500. And as I was pondering this story with that information, I said, do you happen to have clans in your town? And he said, yes, there's, there's clans. And I said, how many? He said, there's three. There's the Jongs, the Lees, and the Lus. And I said, does the leadership rotate from time to time? He said, yeah. I said, and what's that like? And he says, well, you know, there's, there's discord among us. He said, we, we have an uneasy peace. And it turned out that, that this father of this baby boy, is, he was a Jong, um, but when his mother, who was present with us, and who was a Lee, when she had become engaged to her husband, who would be this father's father, when that engagement had been announced, 
his mother's brother had stabbed his would-be father. Bloodshed, just like Jehoram. I said, was anyone ever killed in this bloodshed that happened? He said, no. Um, this has gone on for centuries, and there's been all this fighting, but as far as I know, there's been no murder, but there has been this kind of you know, aggressive behavior with clubs and sticks and chains and knives and whatnot. And so I realized that there was blood guilt on the house. Not something we talk about a lot, it's not one of our favorite things to, you know, explore, but I had the father who was the, you know, living representative of his family line repent of the sin of bloodshed among his clan, the Jongs, and all that they had inflicted on the Lees and the Lus. And I just had him pray much as Ezra and Nehemiah had done and Daniel had done. All of this is found in chapter 9 of their respective books. I don't know what it is about the chapter 9s, but it's Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, and Daniel 9. So I had him repent of the sin of bloodshed among his clan, even though he himself was not guilty of doing any of it. That's an important point, too. That is highly offensive to the American mind, by the way. Because we think, well, I didn't do it. It's not my problem. They did it a long time ago. But if you're linked to somebody by blood, their sin becomes your iniquity. And tomorrow night I'm going to talk more about sin and iniquity and how we deal with that and get people free of iniquity. But that's tomorrow night's message, not tonight. So I'll just say that to dangle it in front of you. All right, so <clears throat> once he'd repented of this sin of bloodshed, um, I used the power that Jesus gives us in John 20, 23, John 20, verse 23, to forgive the sins of those who have sinned. He said, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. Sometimes people think that's only for priests or pastors, but it's actually for all believers. So I forgave the sin, and then I broke the curse that came from the bloodshed. And as we're doing this, that was it. Baby's asleep. And almost before I could stop myself, well, in fact, before I could stop myself, I, the words just came out of my mouth, within three days, your son will be healed. And I was like... I want to put them back in my mouth. Well, at this, the grandmother of the baby, the mother of the father, she goes, what'd you just do? She says, this baby's been crying for two months. I said, well, I just prayed for him in the name of Jesus. And this is all being translated back and forth from Chinese to English. She was still a Muslim. And she, uh, she says, uh, how did you do that? And I said, well, I, I prayed in the name of Jesus. And, and she says, I've never seen anything like that. Now, the baby's not healed yet. The mother's, you know, feeling around down here under the diaper. And she says, it feels smaller, but, but it's still there. But the baby's asleep. So the grandma says to me, um, well, I'm supposed to have my knees replaced tomorrow, <laughs> surgically. Can Jesus do something like that for me? So I said, well, okay, yeah, sit down. So we sit down and we pray, and it took two times, but she gets healed. And then she comes back, and I said, you know, Jesus, uh, Jesus just healed your body. I said, you know, he'd like to do for your soul what he just did for your body. Would you like to switch alliances from Allah to Jesus? And she's, no kidding, she says, yes, I would. Allah's never done anything for me. That's <laughs> exactly what she said. All right, so the next day I get, you know, I'm, I'm there in China ministering, and I'm, I'm with these people. I mean, I'm right in the midst of them, and this couple that had brought their baby, they're members of the church, so it was a very easy loop to verify what was going on. The next day the hernia had shrunk. The next day it had shrunk further, and on day three it was totally closed. And Kmart special, blue light special, the father's inguinal hernia that had been botched when he was eight years old was also healed on the third day. What do we say about this? Jesus wins. That's what we say about that. Now, I mentioned this in a, in a message about deliverance and healing for this simple reason. Curses are always enforced by evil spirits. They don't just sort of float around. If there's no evil spirit backing the curse, the curse can't do anything. So whenever you've got one that's in play and that's wreaking havoc, 
somewhere in that mess, there's a demon or two, and you've got to get rid of them. And so let's go back to Kingdom of God 101. After all, I do call my organization Kingdom Fire Ministries. And in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it reads this way, And Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Is there somebody over here who has a problem in your cervical disc that's, that's giving you difficulty over in this part of the room? Is that you back there? Would you like to get healed right now and not wait till the end of the message? Okay. Alberto or one of you that are traveling? Yeah, okay. Let's just put our hands up toward her. Did you have an accident? Okay. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift our hands toward our sister, and we just release the power of the kingdom of God upon her. We speak now to that herniated disc, and we break the power of pain, and we command everything come into alignment. Let the kingdom of God come in Jesus' name right now. Receive it in Jesus' name. All the pain drain out of the body and neck align. That crook in the neck we command you to come straight. Bones receive the kingdom. Now, break in. There it is. Take more. Take more. Let the power move through you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Keep praying as long as you need to, Alberto. All right, so Jesus said he gave them, or it says Jesus gave them uh, power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. That's Luke 9, 1 and 2. Now, that passage makes it clear that the purpose in sending out the 12 was to proclaim the kingdom of God. That's what he told them to do. Go proclaim the kingdom of God. That, by the way, is also why when I was praying for her, I said, let the kingdom come upon you. I was invoking kingdom because Jesus commanded us to invoke kingdom. It's not a magic formula. It's a declaration of truth. But when we say it, he backs it. That's the way it works. Okay, so... They were told to proclaim the kingdom of God, but do we also see that identical with that, right alongside of it, in complete alignment with it, they were supposed to heal as well. And they were to announce this invasion of God's power breaking in upon disease, sickness, whatever. And so the gospels show us that the proper proclamation of the kingdom and the healing ministry are linked. They're inseparable, in fact. Sometimes people try to separate them, but I think the effectiveness goes down because healing actually proves the veracity of what we're preaching. So we can't preach the kingdom properly without healing, and when we heal, we should declare the kingdom of God. Jesus was a word worker. He linked proclamation with demonstration. And what he did, he taught, and what he taught, he did. And not only that, he told his disciples to do the same thing. This is at the foundation of kingdom theology. There's a lot more we could say about the kingdom of God, but for purposes of what we're doing tonight, that's, that's enough. But there's this uncomfortable truth, or maybe an inconvenient one, that is often overlooked by many people. Right in the middle of Luke 9.1, Luke says something that gives people pause. He says he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Now, in this church, that may not be controversial, but I can tell you in much of the modern church in America today, it's quite controversial. If people believe in demons, it's in a theoretical sense. And if they believe in them, they're what I call New York Times demons. Now, New York Times demons aren't biblical demons. Biblical demons, are they have will, they have intellect, they have malice, they have power. They create bad effects in people's lives, and they are real, and they can be driven out in the name of Jesus. New York Times demons, on the other hand, are, well, if he just had a little more counseling in Prozac, he could have dealt with his demons and he wouldn't have committed suicide. But, you know, it's such a shame that that's just the way it goes. So we are not talking about New York Times demons here. We are talking about biblical demons. Unfortunately, in a lot of the modern theology books, biblical demons have been transmogrified into New York Times demons. And as a result, many Christians don't really know what we mean when we say demons. So I'm trying to be really clear about what I mean when I say this. So it says that Jesus gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Now, how many demons does that leave out? None. All demons. That doesn't mean they won't fight and argue, and sometimes they're entrenched. 
but we've been given power and authority over all of them. And with that, we are to cure diseases, yeah. which suggests that there is a linkage yeah. much of the time between demons and healing or the elimination of demons and healing, if we're going to be a little more precise. So it's a positive thing that he did this, and it's an amazing thing to be given something that has an unlimited scope, all demons, no carve-outs. That's an amazing thing. But Matthew, who reports the same event that we just read about in Luke, Luke 9, he reports on the same event in chapter 10 of his gospel. And in Matthew's account, it says, he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. Amen. So Matthew is even more tightly linking deliverance to healing. And when, whereas Luke says all demons, Matthew says every disease. Yeah. Now that's, that's an insight. Because what it's telling you is that some of these healings that don't work, some of them that are healings gone wrong, if you want to use that language, some of them are because there's a demonic something that hasn't been addressed. It's been overlooked. Or it hasn't been eliminated. And therefore, people continue to suffer. And that's why it says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages driving out demons and healing the sick. He wasn't just dealing with the mentally ill. He was. But he was also driving out demons in order that the sick would be healed. What are some examples of that? You might remember Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus comes out of the synagogue in Capernaum and he comes and he rebukes a fever. You don't rebuke things. That, that word rebuke, it's, it's a word that is always associated with demons in the New Testament. So he tells us, Matthew does, that Jesus was driving out demons as part of his healing ministry. And as an example of it, when he healed Peter's mother-in-law of her fever, he rebuked a spirit. He drove out a spirit that was causing that fever to occur. Does that make sense? You know, one time, this is off script, but it's an interesting story. One time I went to Indonesia, and I was meeting a team there. I came in a day late after they had. And when I got there, the entire team was sicker than sick. I mean, they were green. They're kind of doubled over, and we're meeting in this hall. And I walked in, and I said, what's going on? Everyone's sick. And I'm like, this doesn't look good. And I'm thinking, there's got to be more going on here than just everyone arrived and you know drank some bad water or something. And so I'd only been there a couple of hours, and I started getting sick. Now, what does a Westerner say? Well, they were contagious, and you got around them, and they breathed on you, right? Come on, hands in the air. OK. And I'm thinking, this can't possibly be right. And I'm getting sicker and sicker, and it's getting time for me to preach. And I'm going, how am I going to do this? And all of a sudden, I, it just dawned on me. Jesus rebuked the fever in Peter's mother-in-law. I thought, doggone it, I'm being attacked by a spirit here in Indonesia. So I grabbed one of the teammates and I said, hey, I want you to pray over me. I've got a spirit that's making me sick like all the rest of you. And he comes over and he's all, Jesus, I pray that you would heal Ken. I'm like, no, no, tell that stupid thing to go. Tell it to get. And he's like, Lord, I pray you would deliver. I'm like, stop, just stop. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm feeling really bad, and i got to preach, and the whole team is sick. So I just start rebuking it myself. And I'm like, okay, you in there, get out of me in the name of Jesus. And now my friend kind of kicks into gear, and he goes, yeah, yeah, what he said, what he said. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I just feel this <laughs> hit the floor. <laughs> Boom, the fever left, and I was fine. It's one of the very few times I've been attacked by a spirit, but on that one, I was. And then, now I'm, now I'm just mad dog ugly, right? I'm like, <laughs> me and Clint Eastwood. So I, I took the whole team. I said, all of you, just line up right here. I said, every demon in you that's causing you to be sick, come out! And the whole team, <laughs> they hit the floor. <laughs> They're vomiting and coughing. And when they all got up, every single one of them was healed. I didn't tell that story to ISDM. But anyway, I tell you this to emphasize the point 
that some healings gone wrong have a demonic root, and we got to get a lot better at diagnosing them and a lot better at kicking them out. All right, so driving out demons, as Jesus said, is proof of the kingdom's presence. And therefore, we don't actually have a dyad of healing in kingdom. We have a triad of healing deliverance in kingdom. Because Jesus said, if I, by the finger of God, drive out demons, then you know with certainty that the kingdom of heaven has come among you. Amen. Matthew 12, 28. So apparently deliverance and healing are much more tightly linked than many have thought. And the truth is that a lot of people, maybe most in modern America that are Christians, are uncomfortable with the ministry of deliverance. And they might even, if we were to tell the truth about it, they might even say they actively dislike it. I know some ministries that are prominent healing ministries, but they say, you know, we don't really want to do much with deliverance. All right, so... Why do we have this deficiency in this shortfall? Well, number one, we may have heard theology somewhere along the line that attributes everything to demons. And so, you know, there are these churches that, you know, there's, it's like the demon of my big toe. And if everything is a demon, then nothing's a demon for all practical purposes because you can't discriminate between them. And we actually are trying to discriminate what's really going on here and have a good diagnosis. So that kind of theology is actually quite shallow. And in fact, not everything is a demon. Number two, we may have seen poor examples of deliverance with harsh or arcane behaviors, which leads to foolish and dangerous behavior. I'm thinking of a meeting I did in a different part of China, and some people started manifesting in the meeting. And I, I looked away for a moment, and when I looked back, here came the locals, and they had long bamboo sticks and pieces of chain, and they proceeded to beat the people who were thrashing around on the ground. Well, we had to put a stop to that. But this is such a thing, uh, I mean, it's easy to say, well, that's China, but you know, in, this, in the nation of Australia, they have five states, or seven states, excuse me, seven states, we have 50. And in Australia, five of those seven states, five of them have a law forbidding exorcism because there's been so much abusive behavior over the years, often among immigrant populations, but even among white Australians, that they've just said, nah, you can't do it at all. That's the risk. And sometimes it goes on in America. There have been movies made about horrible, awful things that have gone on in deliverance sessions. There's one that came out on maybe it was around 10 years ago about some guy that lived in a trailer in Arkansas, and this mother brings her daughter out to the trailer to get her daughter ministered to by the deliverance guy, and bad things happen in that trailer. So poor examples will turn people off. Number three, uh, deliverance can seem archaic or medieval to some, and consequently unscientific and out of touch with the modern world. Well, this is nothing more than intellectual pride because most of the world believes in demons. We just tend not to in the roughly one billion people that live in what we call the Western world, which is principally Western Europe, America, North America, and Canada, and maybe Japan and Australia and New Zealand. But after that, throughout the rest of the world, they're quite, even in Russia, they're very familiar with demons. They know that they're there. So... That kind of thinking is intellectual pride. We know more than you benighted fools. The fourth reason, it may seem Pentecostal and perhaps uneducated or lower class and consequently socially unappealing, but that's just a different form of pride. We'll call it social pride. I'm above all that. My income level means that I don't need to believe in those things. And Peter here, he works on Wall Street. He probably knows a thing or two about high-earning high individuals and Probably half the people you know on Wall Street are demonized, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, but I digress. A fifth category of people say that we don't need to focus on demons because what we focus on is what we become like. Or it was all done at the cross. Or Christians can't have demons. But all of this is just poor theology and it's bad church history. And then... Lastly, in some cases, we may have never learned the skills to diagnose demonization, or if we had them, we let them go rusty, and so we're no longer very good at it, and all that means is inadequate training, all of which is fixable. So the usual reasons that people aren't operating in, in deliverance, and I'm thinking specifically in conjunction 
with healing, the usual reasons are actually not very good reasons. So if we go way back to the beginning of this current move of God that began in the 1980s, before there were churches like Bethel even in existence, before Randy Clark was a name in the land, um, when Vineyard was itself kind of still fighting for viability and, and visibility, uh, before Toronto, before the Florida outpouring, before any of these moves of God, um, teaching about the kingdom of God tended to emphasize two aspects, the already and the not yet. And the already was that which is clearly seen and manifested, and the not yet is that which isn't yet seen and manifested, but which will come. And so we kind of wait for the not yet to become the already. And that's because when we study the teaching of Jesus, he talked about the inbreaking kingdom, and he talked about how the kingdom was at hand, but he also talked about when the kingdom would be fully consummated. So even in his teaching, there is this tension. And what it leads to is a two-age framework of already and not yet, and we live right there in the window, the time between the times. And if you, if you want to think about it this way, I've got to make sure I do my number line correctly. My upper elbow here would be the beginning of time, and as time marches on, eventually Jesus comes and breaks in, and then he ascends into heaven over here, and then time runs out, and then the kingdom's fully consummated. And what, we, what we're seeking to do effectively from a kingdom perspective is to narrow that window, to close it down like that. So, in circles where that kind of theology is used, when people are healed, we tend to say, we're experiencing the all met already. And when they're not healed, we say, we're experiencing the not yet. And then what we tend to do is say, sorry, it sucks to be you, but there's nothing much we can do about that, and so we just leave it. And really all that is is a form of passivity, which is another word for unbelief. And so we don't want to be there. We want to move beyond that already not yet thing. And over time, we become soft in our approach to the supernatural side of kingdom demonstration. We may emphasize other valid expressions of the kingdom, for example, feeding, feeding the poor, things like that. Uh, but we forget the fundamentals of ministering as Jesus did, and we say that healing gone wrong is because of the not yet, and you'll just have to wait until heaven. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, all demons and every disease. Yeah. So there's a breakthrough there. Now, I, don't, there, I want to pause here for just one sentence and say there are some other things that can also inhibit healing beyond demons. But right now, tonight, I'm focusing on that. So that's what I'm describing. But don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not saying that all healing gone wrong is purely because of demons. We've got some other things that we've uncovered that can be causes of, of obstruction. And, you know, maybe over time, if I come back again, I'll do some more teaching on what some of those are. But tonight, we're talking about healing and deliverance. So that's where we are. Anyway, but what if some of those healings gone wrong aren't the result of the not yet? What if we've not addressed the root cause of the sickness? And what if healing is hindered because we've not addressed those demons that are present when they are present? And what if deliverance is needed much more often than we think? It's easy to overlook all of that because we become blinded by the very things that control our own culture in which we live. You get on a plane, you go to Taiwan, you might identify much more readily what's going on there. But because we're like pickles in brine, we tend not to see what's really happening in our own backyard. But often the most dramatic examples of kingdom inbreaking happen at that intersection of deliverance and healing and so we have to employ deliverance to bring about the freedom that Jesus paid for with his own life. So what was done at the cross? Because that's the gateway to deliverance. And what was done at the cross is this, Colossians 2.15, God canceled the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross, and he disarmed the rulers and authorities. Rulers and authorities are two orders of demons in Paul's cosmology, and they occur that those that terminology occurs not only in Colossians, it occurs in Galatians and Ephesians. So he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. He humiliated them publicly, triumphing over them in him. So that's what happened at the cross. Jesus won. And if you will, this is the language of the arena. This is the language of gladiatorial combat. So it is to say that Jesus 
And as his vanquished foe fell to the ground, he put his foot on his neck, bloodied sword in hand, and said, Christus Victor! That's a little more masculine, robust than gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And as he did, the emperor went, which would be the father. And so he turns his sword and went, and that ended that. You may not have thought, it that, thought about it that way, but that's the language Paul's using. I'm just illustrating it in a graphic way. Here's what else happened at the cross, Ephesians 1, 20 to 23. God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above, here are those words again, all rule and authority and power and dominion. Oh, even the next two levels up. Doesn't matter how big the demon, doesn't matter how wicked the demon, he is above it all and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one that is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. We're under the authority of Jesus. We are joined to him. He is the head of the body. And that means if you're in the body, no matter if you're a little pinky toe or an earlobe or an appendix or a nose hair or a hand or an eye or a knee, no matter what you think you may be in the body of Christ, all of it's underneath you because you're joined to him. That's what it's telling us. And the third part of it is that deliverance from evil spirits is guaranteed in the atonement, but it's not automatic. And a lot of people believe that as soon as you believe it's all done, you know, one and done kind of thing. But here's the reality. If you've ever been in a church, <laughs> you might know there's some demonized people around. How come they're not all free then? Hello? Not in New Jersey. In California, though, we do have this problem. New Jersey, you guys are more sanctified. <laughs> and the other, the other thing that is mixed up with that is if you study the history of the early church, which most people don't do, I know that, but you don't have to look hard to find the chronicles and annals of the first couple centuries of Christian life after the New Testament was written. I'm talking about the years roughly 90 to... I don't know, call it 300. During that period of time, it was common once people were converted, note that I said once they were converted, they would be taken through deliverance, including at the moment of baptism. And if everybody gets delivered the moment that they're born again, then why were these guys doing that? And they were a lot closer in culture and time and teaching to Jesus than we are. So maybe we've lost something that they had and it's time to recover it. So although deliverance is not automatic, it's guaranteed because deliverance is part of sanctification. And so deliverance is uh, part of the peak experience that brings sanctification to us. And it's maybe less exciting than the more commonplace practices of taking communion and going through baptism and going to Bible study and praying and meditating on the word and going to small group. All of these things will help you become more Christ-like also. But our, our Western model of of sanctification, according to all the theology books, if you read them, is something like this. You know, you, you get converted, and then you kind of chunk along, and you have your kind of ups and downs, but generally it's, it's up and to the, to the right, and it gets better over time, and then when you die, that's it. But I think the biblical model looks more like this. You get converted, then something happens. You get cleaned out, and then you go along, kind of consolidate your wins, and you get some more deliverance. And then you get some more and some more, and so you're already way up here before you go to glory. And that's much more biblical, and it's much more true to experience. And so we have to rethink what we're talking about. And as I said, deliverance is a peak experience. It's a moment where the power of God, the kingdom breaks in upon you, and those spirits are driven out, and now you experience freedom from, well, it might be mental illness, could be physical illness, but whatever it may be. By the way, just a, just a thought on that. I don't know why I feel led to say it right now, but many times people have organic problems, and by that I mean problems in their organs, liver, kidneys, etc. And oftentimes those problems have demonic pro uh, aspects to them. And I, I believe but can't absolutely prove it rigidly from Scripture. I, I could show you why I believe it, but I can't absolutely prove it. That this is why, to the Jews in the Old Testament, the eating of organ meat was forbidden. 
All organ meat was burned as part of the sacrifice to the Lord. And I've, I've just seen this over the years that many, many times when people have specifically organic conditions, lungs, brain, you know, any of that stuff, spleen, intestines, so on, much of the time the stuff that's going on there doesn't have a physical cause, it has a spiritual cause. Does that make sense? I just threw that in for fun. So when deliverance affects inner he uh, physical healing, we're experiencing 1 Thessalonians 5.23, where Paul says, May the God of peace sanctify you fully, spirit, soul, and body. And so John Lake called this triune sanctification. So can Christians be demonized? Well, you probably already know the answer to that because you go to this church, or you can tell from the thrust of my arguments. But in fact, even the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of Grace, contemplates the possibility of people coming under the influence of evil spirits. Now, I just read, you from, uh, read to you from 1 Thessalonians 5.23, but how about this verse from Colossians 2.8? See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. So what's he saying The captivity? Change the word, bondage. Where is it coming from? Philosophy and empty deceit. What's philosophy? The wisdom of human beings, men and women. What's empty deceit? Well, it holds nothing, it's empty, and it is deceptive. It misleads you into believing one thing that is not right so that you will not believe the other thing that is. Yeah. Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition. What empowers philosophy and empty deceit? The traditions of men and women. Culture, it's embodied in culture. And according to, here it is, the elemental spirits of the universe. What are the elemental spirits of the universe? The Greek word is stoicheia, and these are the highest level spirits that overarch, and they govern by principles that get in, enfleshed and lived out through what goes on in culture and society. Paul is saying to Christians in Colossae, see to it you do not become demonized by the stoicheia because your mind has fallen and you have believed error. This is demonization in the mind. That's what he's saying. So sometimes you say, where does it say from Paul that Christians can have a demon? Right there. He had previously warned the Galatian Christians, Galatians 4, 9, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental spirits of the universe? Same word, stoicheia. He's preaching to the Christians in Galatia that time. And he's saying, you've gone back to demonization and you're once again, Galatians, coming under the influence of demonic power. Now, I'm, I'm making this point because so often people struggle with this idea of where is it in the Bible? So I'm showing you where it is. And he says, if you do this, you are seeking to become their enslaves all over again. You've got the NIV up there. I'm reading it out of ESV, but it's the same exact idea. You are seeking to become enslaved, bound once again. That's where Christians can be demonized. Now, we could talk a lot about how they do that, but I think we'll skip that because we want to get to the end and get to ministry. But I just want to say this. Here's another story of somebody healed through a deliverance. This was a woman I met in Taiwan. She'd been saved for 10 years. And Taiwan is a nation that is Buddhist and Taoist and a little bit Shinto, and there's a lot of local gods as well. 95% of the country is non-Christian. And the 5% that is Christian, nearly all of them live in, in Taipei, which is the capital of the country. It's on the north end of Taiwan. This woman, I met her in the southern part of the island in Tainan, which sounds a little bit like the name of the country, but it doesn't sound like Taipei. Taipei's, I said Tainan. Taipei is the capital city in the north. She was in Tainan in the south. There, got that right. And she had a severe digestive disorder that she'd had for all these years, and she was married to a Taoist man. You would say Taoist if you saw it written. But he was a follower of the way of the Tao, which is the right way to say it in Chinese. And as I interviewed her about her stomach condition, she told me, we have an altar to a god in our home and an idol in our home. I said, why on earth do you have that? 
because you're a Christian, right? Why would you do this? And she says, well, because my husband is a Taoist and he wants the idol in the home and please don't be offended. I'm only reporting what they do in Taiwan. I'm telling you about a conversation. I'm not making a statement. As a good Chinese wife, I have to submit to my husband. And so he wants the idol, he wants the altar, it has to stay in the home. And I said, well, okay, so what are you doing with that? And she goes, well, what he likes to do is we put meat on the altar um, and offer it to the idol and we bow in prayer before it and I have to join him because I'm married to him and then we take the meat up and I cook it and we eat it. And I said, well, that's why you have a stomach problem. And she said, what do you mean? And in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul has a whole chapter instructing us about eating meat sacrificed to idols. Most of the modern commentators just completely skip over chapter 10 and make a couple of very brief observations and keep on moving because they don't know what to do with it and they think it all pertains to the ancient world. But change your context out of New Jersey and go to Taiwan or Indonesia or the Philippines or China or India or any country in Africa and you will have this same problem going on. So I said, well, I, what, I don't, why would you do this? I mean, just don't eat the meat. And she said, well, you know, a while back, the main church of the country, and the history there is that around 100 years ago, a mainline denomination that you would recognize, um, they sent a man to Taiwan, and he became what they call the Apostle of Taiwan. And he planted lots of churches and converted a lot of Taiwanese. He married a Taiwanese woman, and he was, there, he was buried in Taiwan. It was a little bit like Jonah. He was buried in Nineveh. So that church has what we would say in business an incumbency advantage or a first mover advantage. And it has outsized market share and outsized voice. So when that church says anything, all those 5% of Taiwanese who are Christian, they pay attention to what the church says. And she said... Um, some years back now, that, that church issued an edict, a decree, that said in order to keep mixed families together, families like hers, where one member was Christian and one was from another religion, because so many families were splitting up over matters of religion, we don't want to see families split up. It's okay for Christians to eat meat sacrificed to idols. That's what they said. So based on that, she proceeded to eat the meat. And I said, well, they're wrong. And she said, what do you mean they're wrong? How can you say that? I said, right here. And I opened this Bible to 1 Corinthians 10, and I read her the chapter. I had a translator. got translated into Chinese. And I said, this is sin. And I said, you need to repent of the sin of eating meat sacrificed to idols. Now, note, where is she being afflicted? Stomach and intestines. Is that organ meat? Yeah. Okay, so... I had her pray a simple prayer of confession over violating the command of the Lord. By the way, in the very end of that chapter, I'm not reading it just to try and save a little bit of time, but at the very end of chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, we do not want to provoke the Lord to jealous anger, do we? We do not think we are more powerful than him, do we? What's he saying? You could actually do that. You could piss God off. Can I say that in church? I just did. It's New Jersey, that's right. So, you know, we live in a time where people are, Jesus loves me, and it's all grace. Now, it is grace. There is forgiveness for every sin under the sun because of the blood, but sin that isn't confessed and sin that is poking God in the eye, which is what Paul as much as says in 1 Corinthians 10, this is different. Now you are entering into contention with God and you are opening gateways to the demonic that you don't even realize you're doing. And there are many other ways to do this besides meat, but this story pertains to meat. So she prays with me and repents of it. It took us about an hour, but we got all the demons out and she was totally healed of her stomach problems. Now, the cool thing about this is that while that was all going on, one of our team got a word of wisdom, not a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. Kind of like when Solomon said, bring me a sword, let's cut the baby in two, and then the, the real mother said, don't cut the baby in two, let the baby live. And the word of wisdom was this, from now on, when you go to the market, buy the meat, but before you go into the home, cut it in half and put half on the counter in the kitchen and put the other half for your husband 
He can do his thing with the idol and then make sure you know which meat is which. Bring it in and cook it all, and you can sit and eat meat with your husband, but you won't be eating meat sacrificed to idols. And I was like, that is Solomonic, and that's a word of wisdom if I ever heard a word of wisdom. Is there grace? Yes. Was the Lord trying to make a way for this woman? Clearly he was. But I tell you that story because in that one, healing came through deliverance because there was a spirit that had come in through the worship of that idol and the eating of that meat. Paul says you cannot partake of the table of the Lord in the table of demons, 1 Corinthians 10, 21. And he's not saying you cannot do it. Of course you can do it. It's more that you should not do it. You ought not to do it. Because if you do, you're taking a risk. But Jesus wins again. Jesus wins again. And she got healed. Now, there's two words for healing in the Greek New Testament. One is therapuo, and it always refers to thera uh, physical healing. We get the word therapeutic from it. The other Greek word for healing is iaomai, and it usually refers to physical healing, but it can have a secondary meaning of healing those who are afflicted with something beyond the physical nature of the problem, i.e., they're sin sick or they have demons, or whatever. So there's actually a, a discrimination in the very language of the Greek. We don't have that discrimination, so it's lost upon us. But when it says therapeuo, we're talking about a physical thing. It might happen immediately, it might be more progressive, but they get healed because of physicality. On the other hand, when the aomai word is in use, that means that there's something else that needs to be addressed. And this is, what, this is an example of where that verse gets used, Acts 10, 38. Jesus went about doing good and iaomai healing all who were oppressed of the devil. There you see the linkage right there. So not all iaomai healings are deliverances because there are other things that can cause complications, but um, deliverance healings are iaomai healings by definition. See that one? It's right there in the language of the Bible. Now, there's a whole bunch of scriptures that show healing through Yaomai, and many of them involve deliverance. The centurion servant who was lying paralyzed and in great pain, it says that in, in the Luke account that he had a spirit. It doesn't say that in the Mark, Matthew account, but in Luke it does. Interesting, and he got healed. The demonized Syrophoenician woman's daughter, or the, the woman wasn't demonized, but her daughter was, and she came seeking help from Jesus. She got a yaomai healing for her little girl. The power that came out from Jesus and was healing them all when they touched him, Luke 6, 18, yaomai healings. The woman with the issue of blood, Luke 8, 47, a yaomai healing tells me that there's more going on than just she had a hemorrhage. I don't know what the problem was, but there was something else there. All right, the 10 lepers in Luke 17, 15, yaomai healing. Leprosy was sometimes seen as a, as a result of violating the commands of the Lord. Here's an interesting one that I'll just throw out randomly, but... We've seen in the last uh, several years a number of young people who have severe acne healed as soon as they stop their rebellion against their parents because they're violating the commandment to honor your father and mother. And as soon as they repented of it, literally their acne dried up and cleared in two or three days. And they were on every kind of, you know, retinin and all that stuff that they didn't matter. None of it was working. And phew, those are all ya -oh my healings. Is it demonic? Maybe not so much. That one's more of a a matter dealing with the commandment of the Lord, so therefore it's in the realm of sin. Um, how about the man at the pool of Bethesda? He'd been lying there for 38 years. When he gets healed, Jesus says, stop sinning or something worse will befall you. It's a yaomai healing. And many who were sick and afflicted with unclean spirits were healed, Acts 5, 16, yaomai healing by definition because they're sick and afflicted with unclean spirits and they get healed. So it's very consistent in the language of the New Testament, and so you know from this that I'm not just making this up. All right, a couple case studies and we'll land the plane. So I was in uh, uh, down near D.C. Uh, about five years ago now, and I'd come home from a long trip, and there was a pastor there that I knew from Maryland, and he'd come to the meeting. We were in Virginia, God's country. 
And uh, this man was at the time in his mid 30s, and he he comes specifically to get prayed for. Now at the time he was under care uh, at the George Washington University Medical Center, and he had been for several years because he had multiple sclerosis, and he had unusual manifestations in addition to the usual stuff kind of tingling and numbness his left side was almost completely paralyzed he walked kind of with a stick but you know he sort of swung his leg like that and if if i put the microphone down you know his arm was rigid so this is kind of how he moved in addition he was three quarters blind in the left eye now when i say that you probably think 75 percent of the light was gone but that's not right if you think of a watch face, from 12 around to 9, it was pitch black, but from 9 up to 12, so this little quadrant here, from 9 up to 12, you could see perfectly. That's a very unusual pattern of blindness. And it's indicative of the kinds of things you see when evil spirits are involved. There's often a weird fact pattern when spirits are present. Well, anyway, he came forward for prayer, and he received ministry, which included deliverance and inner healing. Um, the inner healing pertained to his father, who was a Baptist pastor, who had tried to kill him at one point with a gun, and he had come at him with a shotgun, and the way it happened was the barrel ended up caught between the left arm and the body wall sticking out the back. His father did pull the trigger. He fully intended to kill him. And the, the gun went off, blew the wall out, but guess which side of the body was paralyzed? because that's where the trauma was, because the gunshot went off right there. He felt the, you know, the gun there. Um, and just another kind of ministry tip number 16D, um, a lot of times with healing of multiple sclerosis, this doesn't hold for muscular dystrophy, doesn't hold for um, things like, um, I just, my, just dropped out of my mind, um, cerebral palsy, this is muscular, uh, multiple sclerosis I'm talking about. Many times there is a root that includes some sort of physical abuse or trauma. Many times. And if you clear that, then you can get the spirit that's causing the MS to come out. Many of the diseases you run into where people kind of shrivel up and shrink and they become just a shell of what a human being should be. You know, we're created in the image of God. Satan loves to mock the image of God. So a lot of these weird motor neuron type diseases and so forth, there's demonic activity in there someplace. Note that I'm saying many times, not all, and please nobody feel either defeated or accused when I say that. I'm trying to instruct as I go to give you a few tips and tricks so that your percentages can come up and people who are otherwise in bondage can be healed. So this guy had come with his MS, and we prayed for him, and we dealt with the trauma of the attempted murder, and then we drove out the spirit, and I already described for you how his mobility was impaired. He hit the ground, the spirits came out with a shriek, and then he immediately jumped up and ran all the way around the perimeter of the church, hands in the air, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, and his vision was fine. Well, he decided he was going to write a book about this healing, and he, he's done it. Um, but before he did, he went back to George Washington University, and he said, I want you to run a full set of tests on me as you have done so I have a before and after set of data. And they did it. It took him about three months to do it. Um, and when he went in for his final assessment, he carried with him the dossier they'd given him over the years from his treatments, and it was about this thick. So, you know, he walks in with his thing, and he sits down at the desk, and the doctor slides across to him this thin little folder, and he, the doctor just says, according to this report, uh, you do not have multiple sclerosis. Now, they'd done some um, CAT scans on his head, and MS often gives you lesions on the brain that look sort of like a volcano. And all the lesions were gone. The radiograph was in the file. And the, so my friend, kind of trying to poke the doctor a little bit, he says, yeah, but doc, what am I supposed to do with this pile of papers that you gave me? 
that says I have MS. I mean, you've been telling me for years that I have this condition. And the doctor says, and you know the lawyers were involved in this, and it was, it, this is a verbatim quote, I am not authorized to comment on any medical report you may have previously received from George Washington University Medical Center. So my friend says, yeah, but doc, wait a minute, you were the one who gave me those reports. And the doctor says, I am not authorized to comment. You know where this is going, right? We don't want to be in court for a misdiagnosis. So, all right. So my friend is healed and he walks out and he, he, as he's going through the lobby, there's people in there that have this and that, and this is a neurologist. So there's really serious problems in this lobby. And he said, I realized that day I was the only person who was getting any good news in that doctor's office. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Now there's a, there's a postscript to this story and that is, well, there's two postscripts. Postscript one, in the medical report, they also came back with your type one diabetes has been healed. Not bad. And then the other postscript is that the state of Maryland where he lived and the federal government came after him and prosecuted him for felonious receipt of false, uh, of false disability benefits because his job had been making accommodations for him because of his MS. And so they were prosecuting him for a felony and it went to trial and it was ultimately dismissed by the judge because he had dossier one and dossier two. And so they said, there's no, there's no history of this in any case law, any medical, anything, but we see that this is duly certified and so forth and so in the end he didn't end up going to jail or paying any fines. Jesus wins. What a story, huh? All right, here's another one. This is a woman that I met in South Australia, which is one of the states of Australia. It is in the south of the country, but, but it, it, it's a defined area. And she had macular degeneration. She was in her 40s and um, she came up for prayer and as she approached, I looked at her and I could see that there was a spirit, a spirit wrapped around her head and it looked like a, some sort of headgear, something like a hockey player might wear, that kind of thinner thing so that the guy clocks you on the head with a stick, right? So it kind of looked like that. Um, and she was 95% blind in both eyes from macular degeneration and she could only see light and dark, no colors, no images, nothing. And she was 100% deaf and had been for years. So we broke the spirit over her and she was immediately restored to full sight and hearing. Right. Now, as the ministry time progressed, as the ministry time progressed, um, she went and kind of sat back there with her four children who had come with her. And I'm still up praying for people and I see her doing this. Her children would point at something, let's say, I don't know, that thing over there that says AED or an appeal to heaven. So they'd be pointing at things around the church. And this was a church with a lot of banners and Bible verses and stuff. And so they'd point at them and you could see her doing this and she would say something and the kid would do that. So then she'd do this and they'd point at something else and the kid would do that. So the, what are they doing? They're testing her vision and she's reading correctly. And then, you know, she, they would, they, she's cupping her ear like this and, or her kids are cupping their hands over her ear and they're speaking into her ear, whispering whatever, and she's turning back and repeating to them and they're shaking their heads vigorously. She had never heard any of her four children's voices and now she could. Jesus wins. You want one more? Yes. We got faith in this room. All right, in this case study, um, we had a woman with a retinal melanoma, and she was attending the same church as the woman I just described who had the macular degeneration. Her eye had been operated on to get the melanoma out because melanoma is so dangerous. And, and the, the eye is a weird place to get melanoma to begin with. So right there, if nothing else, you should go to condition yellow, right? I may not be at battle stations, but I'm like, there's something going on here. So she had this melanoma. She'd been operated on. They'd literally sliced the eye in two, gone in, you know, done their thing, sewn it up. And when they sewed it up, they put a nuclear patch in the back of the eye, sewn to the retina. They couldn't do a regular 
radiation from a machine because it would irradiate the brain and everything. So they just put a little tiny patch about this big, sewed it into the retina, and allowed it to emit its radiation into the retina. And then 10 days later, they removed it, and her course of radiation therapy was concluded. So she comes, and she wants to be prayed for for this blind eye. And I'm thinking, awesome, you don't even have a retina. So how in the world is this one going to happen? This is going to be a full-on miracle, right? So we're waiting on the Lord after praying initially and not getting anywhere. And by the way, there's a, there's a lesson in that too. I always tell people, don't make it complex. Don't go looking for demons until you need to look for demons, right? Don't go looking for that 48 generations of inner healing until you need to be doing that. Just try to pray with authority and faith and see what happens. You can get more complex later if you need to. So we'd prayed, and we hadn't gotten anywhere. So we're waiting on the Lord. And while we're waiting on the Lord, I see a, a, a vision of a man with a divining rod. Now, maybe you don't know what that is, but it's a Y-shaped stick. And he's standing on what appears to be a low dike, maybe about half as high as his stage. And he's, you know, he's doing his thing with the divining rod. And people who divine, it's divination. There's a lot of divination in New Jersey. They use it to find water wells. And that's what this guy was doing. In Texas, they use it to find oil wells. So he's going along doing his thing, and presently the, you know, the rod dips, and so they found water. And I said, I'm seeing this picture of this guy doing this. What does this mean to you? And she goes, I described the man to her. I described the clothes and everything. She goes, well, that would be my grandfather. I said, was he a farmer around here? She goes, yeah, he had a place up the road about 100 kilometers. And I said... Um, was he a, was he a diviner? And she says, well, yeah, I saw him do that many times. And I said, well, he committed the sin of divination. And she says, she breaks into tears. But my grandfather would never do that. He was a godly man. He loved the Lord. I said, well, you just told me he was a diviner in response to the vision I had. Now, this is a, this is a common snare for many Christians, like our woman in Taiwan. She was doing something not really knowing it was not okay. And so with this grandfather who has now gone to the Lord, but he was doing something very serious. Divination is forbidden in Scripture. And by the way, it is one of a number of sins that carries the penalty of death. Guess what happens? We don't kill people anymore. That's good when they transgress. But spirits of death will enter when people commit those same sins that once were punishable by death under the old covenant when we lived under Moses. And so when you run into this stuff, spirits of death are generally present. Maybe not every time, but nearly every time. What is she at risk of due to her melanoma? Hello? Yeah. Death. So I had her confess her grandfather's sin, generational repentance, and then we drove the spirit out, and notwithstanding the surgery that had removed her retina and the nuclear you know, radiation that had been in there, it, in about three hours, her vision was completely restored. Initially, she could see, but not fully, and then the field of vision widened, the clarity got crisper, and the color came in. It started out black and white. Three hours later, she was done and dusted, as they say. So, as you can tell from these stories I'm telling you, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye, and it, on some level, maybe we've been digging a little too shallow of a trench, but God is a God of breakthrough, and he's giving us insight now into things that perhaps have been shut away for a long time. I'm going to tell you one other one. This, is, this one's an interesting one. This was a Chinese woman in my church. And I, uh, I came in one morning, and I, I'm gone a lot. So, you know, when I, when I come in, it's, you know, Ken's here, and people start lining up. I'm supposed to be home to rest, but I just end up changing the venue where I'm working. So they bring this woman to me, and she had divorced her husband because he was molesting their son. And um, she'd kind of gone on with her life for a while, seemingly okay, and then uh, while I was away on one of my trips, she literally just went crazy, and no one could figure out why. And so she'd been crazy for um, quite a while, several months. And 
no one could understand what had happened to her. So they brought her to me for prayer. And I began to talk with her as best I could because, like I said, she was, she was literally raving crazy. But what she told me was after being single for a while, she wanted a new husband. And she was Chinese, so she'd gone down to downtown Los Angeles and gone to Chinatown, and she'd visited a Chinese herbalist, read medicine man or shaman. Right. And that Chinese herbalist had given her a potion. It was a love potion. And the herbalist told her, when you find the guy that you want to have fall in love with you, give him this to drink and make sure that as soon as he drinks it, you are the first thing he looks at because whatever he looks at first, he will fall in love with it irrevocably. I know this sounds crazy. You may think I'm out of my mind, but I assure you this is a true story. So she took the potion home. And she had a guy in mind, but she wanted to know, is this going to work? So she went in the bathroom and drank half the bottle and then looked at herself in the mirror. <laughs> Springs are coming out everywhere. Steam's coming out of the ears. So I said, that wasn't the best idea you ever had. So I had her confess several sins, starting with potions, witchcraft, right? So consulting the herbalist as a Christian who shouldn't be doing any of this. I had her confess all of that. I broke the power of the spirit and I commanded it to leave and instantly her sanity returned to her and she's fine to this day. Jesus wins. Amen. All right, let's, clant, let's land the plane. Number one, we are still commanded to proclaim the inbreaking kingdom of God. It's central to what we do and we are commanded to heal as an attestation of the very message we proclaim. Now, of course, if you're not proclaiming, you may not be doing much healing, but the idea is that we are a forward deployed army, and I would say the hour is dark enough in our country right now. It's time to get off the bench and get in the fight. We just all got to do it. Number two, we need to incorporate deliverance in order to see healing work more reliably and consistently. Number three, not all healing gone wrong is the result of the so-called not yet of the kingdom. It may, in fact, be the result of incomplete and therefore incorrect diagnosis and subsequent mistargeted prayer. And we are called to be a miraculous church and therefore we still have a calling upon us to preach the kingdom of God today and to heal and often to do so by driving out demons. And with that, I will stop right here. Amen.